Hi everybody, I'm Shadow. I decided to analyze Kenshin Impact A Winter Night's Lasso video. I won't cover anything that's been said by other Kenshin Impact theorists on YouTube, I will just focus on details that I noticed and I'll add a few of my theories as well. Disclaimer. This is just a theory video. My theories are not the official lore of the game. Also, this video will contain spoilers about the story so far. I will base my theories, my guesses, on elements available in the game and in the official videos released by MiHoYo. I will not include any leaks in my video. With that being said, I've watched A Winter Night's Lasso so many times I've basically memorized the script. Let's start from the chessboard, which is the most interesting part of the video since it represents everything that happened and that's going to happen in Tabat. I'm not going to talk about the famous game between the world chess champion Garry Kasparov and the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue. I'm not a chess nerd, so I'm not even going to try. If you want to know more about it, Ashikai explained that chess game in her video. I'll link the video in the description. What is interesting is the fact that, for the Harbingers, stealing an Arkhan's Gnosis doesn't mean that the Arkhan has been defeated. If it were so, the Queen, which is Barbados's Gnosis, and the Rook, Rex Lapis's Gnosis, wouldn't be on the board. This means that the two Arkhans are still considered enemies, they still have moves to make that could potentially hinder the Tsaritsa's plans. Furthermore, Pierrot says that Checkmate is not where the game ends. He basically told us that they are not completely interested in defeating the Archons. The game will end in some other way that goes beyond how a normal chess game should end. And yes, I'm Italian, so it's Piero, not Piero. We could also think that the Archons are still needed for their plans, not just their noses. That's why they're still on the board, maybe? Another detail that I'd like to talk about is how the White Knight moves. We can see that Pierro is using his hands to move his pieces. He was reaching for the Black Pawn when Signora's Moth arrived. So who moved the knight? Well, unless Pierro enjoys having a monologue on his own to explain things to himself, he's clearly playing and talking with someone. If we look closely, when the White Knight moves, it leaves a trail behind. It really looks like condensed water vapor, you know, the mist the ice produces when it sublimates, that is, when it goes from a solid state straight to a gas state. Now, he's not playing with the other harbingers, because in the next scene, they are still approaching Signora's coffin, so they just arrived. Who's the only other person who is expected to be present at the funeral of one of the highest ranking members of the Fatui? I am pretty sure Pierro is talking to the Tsaritsa, and she moved the White Knight with her elemental skill. She's the Cry Archon, and the chess piece is leaving a trail that only eyes can produce. Now, about the chess game, let's try to deduce who the white pieces are. We know too little about the Fatui to figure out who the black pieces represent. As you can see on the board, there's the Queen, Barbados, the Rook, Rex Lapis, a Knight, the Shogun, four pawns, and the King. Let's talk about the pieces off the board first. That can make my theory easier to understand. Off the board there's the other knight, the other rook, two bishops and four pawns. Let's assume that the bigger pieces are archons, except for the king. One of the big pieces off the board has to be the god of the wood, the original Dentro archon, the one who won the archon war. This means that one of the pawns on the board is Kusanali. One of the pawns off the board, sadly, is Makoto. A was always supposed to be the real Electra Archon. I think Makoto was just waiting for her to mature more before she could give her the Gnosis and make her the rightful Archon. We know that the God of Justice, the current Hydra Archon, is not the original one. The first Hydra Archon died during the Cataclysm. So, since we don't know anything about Fontaine, or at least we don't know enough, I think that the God of Justice should be a pawn on the board and the previous Hydra Archon a big piece of the board. Murata, Murata, I don't know how to say that, the Pyro Archon is just another big piece off the board. Online, she's spoken about in past tense, always, as if she's dead. Lastly, I believe that the last big piece, probably the Knight, if the developers wanted to give us a very subtle hint during the video, is the original Cryo Archon. While the Tsaritsa may see herself as just a pawn in this whole game, so another pawn off the board. In this case, not because she's dead, but because she's obviously not going to be an obstacle in the Fatui's plans. 
The way I assign the archons the pieces is based on the fact that there are two bishops and I honestly think we will always get a different piece as we travel from nation to nation. Now what's left are two pawns on the board and two pawns off the board. Many believe that the travelers are part of this chess game. I'm kinda skeptical about it. When this chess game began, that is when the Fatui made the first move, the traveler was just going around Tevat with Paimon. They didn't interact with the Archons nor the Fatui. How did they do that since they're everywhere, who knows? So they were unknown to everybody. Why would Piero put them on the board? There is one chance though in my mind that both Eder and Lumine are the two white pawns on the board because they were in Canria when everything happened. They may as well be one of the reasons the Cataclysm happened. They came from another world and have powers that don't exist in Tvad, as we can see from the fight against the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles. The pieces on their clothing that change according to the element we're using were pure white, so an element that's beyond the seven elements in Tvad. And they have those fairy wings on their backs as well. Maybe they share knowledge with the people of Karia, in particular with Dina Dottir, aka Gold, knowledge that the people of this planet shouldn't have. Anyway, since the Tsaritsa lost someone important to her in Kanria, which is the reason she turned from a gentle soul, too gentle in fact, to a god with no love left for her people. If the travelers are somehow responsible for the cataclysm, she might have put them on the board as enemies. Also, considering that every time the Traveler tries to defend the Archons, the Fatui always manage to get their noses, I honestly would put the Traveler we use on the black side of the board. Feels like we're actually helping the Tsaritsa. We try to defend Benti and Signora Stolis' noses. We helped the people of Liwa against Ozile and this gave Rex Lapis all the reasons to believe that he was not needed anymore, so he gave his noses to Signora. We tried to defend the people of Inazuma and Yaimiko had to give Scaramouche Ace Gnosis to save our lives. Are we really helping the Archons here? Anyway, enough with the chessboard. Let's talk about the Harbingers. I won't talk about all of them, there are one too many videos about them already. I will only talk about four of them. Just to be clear, and he is not one of the four Harbingers I want to talk about, Pantalone is not Baiju. Why? But you heartless businessmen and dignitaries always with a convenient excuse to remain in the comfort of your homeland. And in the moment of cessation of the Pale Flame set, it says he was not one of the favored and could only pursue worldly power. So he doesn't leave Sneshnaya and he doesn't have a vision, while well, Baiju has one. And he lives in Liyua. The first harbinger I'd like to analyze very briefly is Arlecchino, more specifically her eyes. She has this red axe pupil shape that is really interesting. We know that eyes and ears are defining characteristics of different nationalities or species, like the people from Caria, so Piero, Dainslev, Kaya, even Halfdan, they all have that kind of primogen pupil shape. Pulcinella, Jansan from Natlan, Klee, and I suppose Alice are elves kind of people. Then we have Yaimiko and Sucrose as foxes, where Yaimiko is specifically a kitsune, while Sucrose, well, in Mondstadt we have crimson foxes and snow foxes in Dragon's Pine, maybe there's another kind of fox that we don't know yet, like it could be called Verdant Fox, who knows. Anyway, Arlecchino's eyes are probably indicators of yet a new species of demi-humans or a specific nationality that we don't know yet. The harbinger that intrigues me the most is Sandrone. Something tells me that the little woman on the hand of the strange rune guard is not the real Sandrone. Sandrone is either the rune guard or another person who is not even there. I base this statement on the fact that Sandrone is also called Marionette and in Commedia dell'arte she was an actual Marionette. So I think someone is pulling her strings making her look like a real person. Sandrone also looks awfully similar to Catherine from the Adventurers Guild. Rebooting. And we know that this institution hails from Sneshnaya. Also, later in the video, when the Harbingers bow their head in respect to Signora, Sandrone is the only one who doesn't close her eyes. Why? This has been bothering me ever since I've seen the video for the first time. Next, we have Dottore. He's complicated. Now, we all know that Dottore can make copies of himself at different times of his life. 
We met one version of him in the manga, maybe two versions of him considering how he switched from being over the top to bored to death. Then we have a version of him at Signora's funeral, who may also be the one who in the future is going to Sumeru with Colombina to get the danger gnosis. The last Dottore we kinda know is the segment in the prime of his life. Since the Dottore who's burning down the tree is moving his lips, he's the one who's answering the question. The younger version of himself that they're talking about is somewhere else, conducting that experiment in blasphemy. Now this is my theory, or better, two possibilities. Since this is Kolei's premonition, maybe Dottore will have already found Scaramouche and is tinkering with him now that he has the Electronosis, or they do have the remains of an elemental being in Snezhnaya. We could easily deduce how reviving an elemental being could be considered blasphemous. To that, add the fact that Dottore enjoys modifying people into whatever he wants to turn them into. Having both Signora's remains and Dottore in Sneshnaya sounds like a recipe for disaster. But we should all ask ourselves a question. What is there in that coffin? I mean, like Signora says, Not even ashes will remain! So... Anyway, the last harbinger I want to talk about, Pierro. His elegance is astonishing, by the way. To talk about him and the theory I have about him, I'm taking a huge detour that goes back to version 2.5, specifically the Imperatrix Umbrosa Act 2, Transient Dreams. After we defeated the Magatsu Mitake Narukami no Mikoto, the puppet that will become the weekly boss, and after planting the Sacred Sakura Tree Seed, we found ourselves talking with Raiden A and Yaimiko about what happened. A speculates that Makoto got a higher power involved in all of this. This means that Makoto went to Karya together with Istaroth, the goddess of moments, for a specific reason. From what Makoto tells A, we can kinda think that Makoto wasn't really in favor of the heavenly principles. In fact, she says Eternity extends time into infinity. Dreams illuminate each moment within. When both shine in unison, the sacred Sakura blooms from the darkness, finally free from the clutches of the heavenly principles. She says that eternity is or Makoto's true power, and each moment within Istaro's power, together will make the tree grow and bloom in an instant, because in that place and with those powers, this is possible since the heavenly principles cannot do anything about it. I hope that makes sense. Let's analyze this in another way. When the Traveler and Paimon reached Raiden A and the Shogun, we understand that a considerable amount of time had passed within Makoto's consciousness. How come you have not changed at all in all these years? Then, the Raiden Shogun clearly tells us, Let this be our final duel, the conclusion to that which began 500 years ago. I believe that the duel lasted 500 years by the time went backwards rather than forward. Yaimiko also says that it was a place where time is meaningless and cannot be understood with ordinary logic. When Makoto gave A the seed, she planted it in that place and time. Remember, the Tori gate to Makoto's consciousness is just beneath the sacred sacred tree, and the duel began in the present but ended 500 years in the past. That's why the sacred sacred tree appeared out of nowhere on Mount Yoko during the Cataclysm, even though... I know you've always perceived there was something special about the sacred sakura, but to me, it has always been there. Now, once we've ascertained that Makoto was helped by Isaroth 500 years ago in Karya, why did Makoto go there in the first place? She wasn't a warrior, so we can easily rule out the possibility that she went there to fight Kanria. What could she have done in Kanria other than sealing the seed of the sacred sacred tree to help Inazuma against the darkness that enveloped the nation? Who is the other character that we know to be from Kanria that suddenly appeared out of nowhere in a different time? Kaya. We know from his character story that he was abandoned by his father in front of the Dawn Winery, where he was adopted by Creepus Ragambinder, Diluc's father. How did Kaya get to modern time Mondstadt from 500 years ago, Kanria? Many theorize that Kanria is still inhabited to this day, that not everybody was turned into monsters just because Stainsleff says that In the hidden corners where the gods gaze does not fall, 
there are those who dream of dreaming. When speaking of Karia, if Karia is still inhabited, this could mean that Kaya is simply someone from modern time Karia, who was brought and then abandoned in Mondstadt. I disagree with this theory for one simple reason. Piero. Yeah, I'm finally back to the Harbingers. Piero is a witness to everything that happened in Karia 500 years ago. Once again, the pale flame set gives us some insight into the Harbingers. The Mocking Mask talks about Piero. Back then, he tried to earn the favor of the previous ruler, but he failed because he wasn't as knowledgeable as the sages. Because of this, he was ignored when he tried to stop the sages from tearing away the Veil of Sin, which is what led to the Cataclysm and then to the destruction of Karya. My theory is simple. Makoto was against the destruction of Karya. Being a nation without gods doesn't necessarily mean that they despised them, they simply didn't rely on them. Makoto went to Karya to save, with the help of Isteroth, someone who would be able to do something about Karya in the future. May that be simply restoring the good name of the nation or lead the revolution against Celestia so that no other nation will be destroyed again. Makoto may have given her life to be granted her wish or to fuel the power of Isteroth to bring to the present Kaya his father and Piero, probably a counselor of some sorts. We know what happened to Kaya, we have no idea what happened to Kaya's father. For all we know, he may have already been cursed and he just managed to leave his son in a safe place before going away and turn into a monster. And we definitely know where Piero is now. Also, in the Maki Mask, Piero says that he devoted himself to Her Majesty, who understands his pain. The Tsaritsa lost someone very dear to her in Karia. As Child says, She had to harden herself. Her life changed after the Cataclysm, so who has she lost? Two options are available. The first one is that she lost the person she loved. This is too cliché and it would be identical to Signora's story, so I don't really believe it to be the right one. If it is though, my bet is on the original Hydra Archon who died in the Cataclysm. Maybe he was the one she loved? The second one is the one I believe the most. She lost her father or mother, the original Cryarch, and who died around the time of the Cataclysm. Because we know that the Tsaritsa is not the original Cryarch. There is actually a third scenario in which she lost her son or daughter, but since no Archon so far has had any kid, this scenario is not so believable. Though, if we think about Jean Li and his very long list of titles the god of contracts, the god of commerce, the god of war, Morax, Rex Lapis. Is the idea that he also has the title of Adeptus so strange? If he's an Adeptus, since both Gan Yu and Yan Fei were born of a human and an Adeptus, this means that Archons can have offspring if they wanted to. The problem here is that in this case, both the original Cryo Archon and her kid would have died in the Cataclysm, and this makes things more complicated. Was the original Cryo Archon her kid and she became the Archon after their death? Or was he the father of her kid and they both died in Karia? This is why I don't believe this to be a feasible scenario. Too complicated and too cruel. Moving on, I think that the Tsaritsa's plan and Piero's real plan against Celestia are very different. But the Tsaritsa doesn't know. She wants absolute peace. So no more destructive wars like the Archon War, no more higher power deciding over the lives of people like Karia. Piero is the jester, he's a trickster. He says that he devoted himself to the Tsaritsa because she understood his pain, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they share the same goal. It could mean that he's using the pain that they both share to use her authority and reach his own goal. He promises Rosalind, Signora, that her final resting place will be the entirety of the old world. Many think that the old world is simply Tvat. If you read the book Before Sun and Moon from Ankanomiya, and I'm not analyzing it in this video because it's already long enough, Phanes, probably one of the primordial god's shades, used the eggshell from which it was born to basically create a domain that was separated from the universe. I believe this eggshell is the Vat, a huge domain in which life was brought while the primordial one fought the dragon lords of the old world. 
the promised land, so to speak, to make it suitable for life. In the book, it is also said that the eggshell needed to be broken to create the world, but Thanos didn't do it. The primordial god kept essentially terraforming the old world together with the other shades while Thanos let the original people live protected and cared for in the eggshell. Then Celestia came, they fought and won against the primordial one, the heavens collapsed on the eggshell and Ankanomia fell into the abyss. I believe the eggshell was tipped over and everything went upside down, the reason why Tevat doesn't have a true sky. The theory here is that the abyss is actually above and Tevat is underground. The false sky is made of stars, but the stars are the immensal fruits, the fruit that the branches of the world tree bear. The moon and the sun are not real, they were made by Celestia to give a reality effect so that the people wouldn't question anything. Think about it, the travelers came from another world, they first went into the abyss, then they reached Caria, a nation that is considered subterranean. They stayed there for a while, then they tried to leave the world, but they found the sustainer of heavenly principles just outside, and she caught them both. Lumin was sent back to Caria, and she saw the destruction in progress, while Ether remained suspended for 500 years until he woke up in Tevat. The entrance to the eggshell, the domain that is half Tevat and half Abyss, is above, where you can see the true sky. Anyway, I believe Piero wants to destroy the eggshell and free the people from this domain, finally completing the primordial god's will. Remember that Kanria tried to steal the book before Sun and Moon from Enkanomiya when the people were about to leave to Watatsumi Island. This means that they know the truth about Tevat, otherwise why would they want that specific book? One last thing and I'll finally end the video. I want to briefly talk about the building where Signora's funeral took place. Many are saying that it's just a church for the funeral, others say it's Signora's mausoleum. I believe each harbinger has their own palace. They are extremely important people in Snezhnaya. Pulcinella is even halting the entire nation for half a day for Signora's funeral. If you look at the building, it resembles the Piotrovsky Palace, one of the Romanov palaces in Russia. In Genshin Impact, the Tsaritsa simply encased the whole palace in ice, making it a sort of mausoleum for Rosalyn. Her resting place is her own home. Considering I'm bringing the Romanov family into my theory, I think and I hope that the Tsaritsa's name is going to be some edited version of Anastasia Romanova, more commonly known as Anastasia, the last of the Romanov. That's it for the video, I just checked the recording and it's above 22 minutes, so this is a very long video. If you have any theory of yours that you want to share, I'll be very happy to read them and discuss them with you in the comment section. If you have any question or any suggestion, feel free to let me know. If you like this video, remember to leave a thumbs up and if you want to watch more videos about Genshin Impact and the theories around it, subscribe and turn on the notification bell. See you in my next video, over and out.